We're going to be talking about a, a, a fluorescence microscopy technique called raster image correlation spectroscopy. Right? That's what the RICS stands for here. And we're using this to be able to measure certain biophysical parameters of dorsal in the live tissues. Okay, so remember that we have this, this model of the dorsal gradient. And what's unfortunate about it is we can take this model, we can fit it to data, but there's actually still, even when you constrain the model to data, it's still under constrained. There's a large, there's a wide range of parameter values that all fit the data as reasonably well. And what that means is if, if all I have are my dorsal venous data and I take the model and I fit the model to those data, then I could be at one end of the parameter space or a whole different end of the parameter space and both of them fit the, fit the data well, which means if I want to use the model for prediction, then I'm going to come up with multiple different kinds of predictions, right? Because I don't know where in parameter space I actually am, okay? So what I'd really like to do is I'd like to be able to, to fit the model to the data, but also to narrow down where I am in the parameter space by directly measuring some of these parameters, like measuring things like the diffusivity or the nuclear import-export rates, etc. So how would I do that? So one of the ways that we can do this is by using statistical fluctuations to measure the mobility of dorsal in my live tissue, in my embryo, or in the cell, or in the nucleus, or whatever it is I'm looking at. So these videos here that you're looking at on the screen, uh, there are two uh, that I'm showing here. One is focusing on the ventral side, which you can see here. And the other one is focusing on the dorsal side, which you can see here. So you have, um, in the green channel, you have dorsal GFP. And shown here in magenta um, is histone red fluorescent protein. So it's red fluorescent protein. It's inside the nucleus. Um, both on the ventral side and on the dorsal side. And the whole point of this histone RFP is for us to see where the nuclei are. Right? So dorsal is either in the nucleus or out of the nucleus, depending on what side of the embryo you're looking at, but histone is always marking the DNA, always marking the nuclei. Okay. Um, what else you can see maybe here, I don't know, the, it's kind of bright in this room for you guys to see it, but these videos are a little bit grainy. Um, I don't think I can turn down the lights any better. Uh, but the, the videos are a little bit grainy. Um, and it's not because we are doing a bad job imaging. And it's not because the, the microscope is actually has a lot of noise in its detection mechanism. It's actually because what we're looking at is statistical movements of individual dorsal GFP molecules. So that's what the graininess is. And if we wanted to like, if we wanted to make it more smooth, we can average multiple time frames together and it looks smooth and the, the, the noise goes away. But the noise is actually what we're looking for. These are real true statistical fluctuations of the location of the dorsal GFP molecules in the tissue. And the last thing I want to point out here is this dorsal is in the nucleus down here, right? But it's also in the cytoplasm. This, there's a non-zero amount of GFP in the cytoplasm. Furthermore, on the dorsal side of the embryo, it's mostly in the cytoplasm, but there's a non-zero amount of dorsal in the nucleus as well. But we knew that, right? Because that's what deconvolution is for, is because there is a non-zero amount of dorsal in the dorsalmost nuclei that we, that's probably dorsal cactus complex, right? That we have to background subtract out. Okay. But what we can do is we can use these sorts of movies and their statistical fluctuations to measure the diffusivity of dorsal. So how do we do that? So we do that, um, through an offshoot of a technique called fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. So these, these videos that I was showing before, they were taken with a confocal microscope, which means there's a laser. And the laser is being focused on a very, very small portion of the tissue. And the laser focus gets intense enough to really excite your dorsal GFP molecules only in a very small window here. And it's not just the intensity of, of, the, um, of the laser. It also has something to do with, um, with the fact that as a confocal microscope, you were able to reject the out-of-focus light that we were talking about a while ago a few lectures ago, and only look at the in-plane, the in-focus uh, plane. Right? So that's why you get a clean, crisp image. So essentially what you have is you have only a small volume in your tissue that, uh, which is where you're actually exciting and detecting your fluorescent molecules. This volume, uh, it's not symmetric. Uh, it's symmetric in the xy direction. But in the z direction, which is the axis along which the objective uh, is and where the microscope is, is um, detecting, uh, it's longer in this z direction than it is in the x and y direction. 
Okay, so you have this volume of molecules, and what you're measuring when you're measuring fluorescence is you're basically collecting all the photons that are coming off the molecules that are being emitted from that, vol from that volume. All right, so how many molecules do we have in our volume? Well, we could have 10, we could have 20, I don't know, right? But the number of molecules in that volume at any particular time is a random variable, right? And so if we measure the fluorescence coming off of that one pixel over and over and over and over again, we're going to get something that fluctuates around some average, right? So here is the fluctuation in my fluorescence, and the dashed line is, say, our average. And what I can do is I can measure the, the way that these fluorescence fluctuations are correlated to each other to tell me something about how fast the molecules are moving in the volume, in my tissue. Okay? Uh, there's something missing here. This, I think this needs to have a bar over the top of it. It's F bar because it's the average. Right? So our fluctuation, delta F, is our actual value minus our average value. And our average value is not dependent on time, so I don't know why that's there. So let's imagine that I have a GFP molecule that I'm measuring, um, like dorsal GFP. And on average, there should be 20 dorsal GFP molecules in my volume. But sometimes there's 25. So sometimes I have a fluctuation above average. Sometimes there's 15. And so I have a fluctuation below average. Okay. <clears throat> you can imagine that because the fluctuations above average, they represent a real physical state of the system. Like, in my volume, I really physically have 25 molecules. Then at, at some time delta t later, or tau later, um, as it's usually um, put, at some delta t later, if it's a short enough delta t, I still have more than 20 molecules in there. Because the molecules don't move at the speed of light. right? So if I measure it at 25 molecules, 5 above average at some snapshot in time, then a very, very short time period later, I'm still going to have above average number of molecules. Okay? If I'm measuring a fluctuation below average, then in some short time period later, I should still have a below average number of molecules in there. Right? So the rate at which these fluctuations above or below average decay back to the average, on average, is going to tell me something about how fast the molecules are moving around. If the molecules are moving around really, really, really fast, then a fluctuation above average, say to 25, some short time period later, I might see 20 again because they're moving so fast. If they're moving really slow, then that same short time period later, I'm still going to see 25, right? So that's kind of the, the basic physics of it. And But there's a lot of statistics involved. Uh, it's not just, um, you know, it, it's not just whether or not I have something above average and some time T later I have something below average. It's whether or not a fluctuation that you see, which is related to the, the actual individual molecules that are in your volume, is still correlated to the fluctuations you're seeing some time t later, some time tau later. Uh, so it's all about correlation. And if you wait long enough, then the fluctuations become decorrelated, uncorrelated. Okay. So if the molecules are moving slowly, let's take uh, this particular fluctuation right here. If the molecules are moving slowly, then if I look in this next time window, like this time window, and this time window, and that time window, then on average, I should see something above average. That's not always true. You can see in this particular case that the next time that's measured, you have something below average. That's okay. That doesn't, that doesn't completely blow up our, our view of the system, because what we're looking on average, how is it above or below average? So there's a lot of averaging going on here. There's a lot of statistics. There's a lot of measurements. But <clears throat> what we're looking at here is something that's a function of tau, right? So how long am I waiting between my two measurements that I'm looking at to see if there's correlations in the fluctuations, okay? So this particular tau, or delta t, is that long, okay? And so I can say, well, my measurement here and my measurement there, are these two fluctuations correlated? But also, if I'm looking here, I can also ask the same question about here, which is also the same tau. And I can do that for every delta, uh, for every tau, for my every time difference as I march along my, my data set. Okay? And then add all of those up and then finally get an average of whether the fluctuations are correlated. Okay? So that's a long explanation, uh, for what, for how to build what's known as an autocorrelation function. Okay? So the autocorrelation function is, which is usually denoted as g, and it's a function of tau. It's a function of, of how long in the future your, or how, how, far apart your two time points are. 
that you're, that you're correlating fluctuations for. And so it's equal to, and this should be, there should be an average here, a little angle brackets which denote averaging over time, over all values of t. Um, it's your, your fluctuation at time t times your fluctuation at time t plus tau, all divided by, and this again should be average, your average um, fluorescence squared. Now, as I said before, these fluctuations, if the molecules are moving super fast, they become decorrelated very quickly, uncorrelated. Okay, so <clears throat> if I look at my autocorrelation function as a function of tau, this is on the x-axis down here, this is tau. As a function of tau, if something, if this autocorrelation function decays to zero relatively fast, that means I have fast diffusion, I have fast molecules. If it takes longer for this autocorrelation function to, to decay to zero, in other words, if it takes longer for these fluctuations to become uncorrelated, that means these molecules are moving more slowly. So what I can do is I can take my data, I can calculate my autocorrelation function, and I can look at its shape, and I can tell something about how fast the molecules are moving. And in fact, um, there's a model for this, and you can quantitatively fit it to these data here, and actually do a parameter estimation for your diffusivity. The next thing that I wanted to point out, last thing for today, is that um, not only can I get diffusion out of my autocorrelation function, but also, if I measure the amplitude of the autocorrelation function, or g at tau equals zero, that's equal to one over the number of molecules that I have in my volume. And we'll, we'll do that derivation next time, okay? But what this means is that if I have, um, if I wanna measure the absolute concentration of my uh, dorsal GFP, or wh whatever it is I have, then I can do that by calculating the autocorrelation function. And that will tell me the number of molecules that I have in my confocal volume. And confocal volumes are, are, are stereotypical, right? So for a particular laser, for a particular microscope, uh, I, can, I know what my confocal volume should be. So if I know my volume and the number of molecules in my volume, I can calculate the absolute concentration. Okay, so there's a really, really major um, uh, biophysical parameters that I can measure using this method. Today, we're going to finish up this lecture on raster image correlation spectroscopy, and then that will be it for the end of the semester. So um, to get a little piece of that, I wanted to, to do some derivations with this autocorrelation function here. Okay, so you, your autocorrelation function, which again is traditionally uh, the letter capital G, and it's a function of tau, which is your time shift, that's equal to, in angle brackets, delta of f at time t times delta of f at time t plus tau divided by your average value of f, your average fluorescence, squared. Um, these angle brackets, they denote um, uh, like averaging over all time. So from time t equals zero to t equals t final. So it's, it's a time average thing. So you're multiplying your fluctuations together um, at two different time points, at time t and at time t plus tau, and you're averaging out your, your t variable. So the only thing left is your tau variable. Okay, but this delta uh, of f, this thing here, oops, why is that doing that? This delta of f, this is um, f at time t minus f bar, so it's the, the average subtracted out, so that's your fluctuation. So therefore, this is then equal to your angle brackets again. So everything is happening inside the angle brackets, right? So I'm just going to expand out this delta. So this delta is f of t minus the average f times f at t plus tau minus the average f still inside the angle brackets, and you're still normalized by f bar squared. I can multiply these things out and on, on the um, angle brackets on the inside. And angle brackets are, um, they're, they're an average, it's an integral, so it's a linear operator. And so if I have multiple terms, then I can put the angle brackets all around each term. But when I have two things multiplied together, I can't separate those two out.
right? So, because it's a, it's a linear operator, just like an integral, right? Um, so like if you have the integral of this, of you know, A plus B, that's in, equal to the integral of A plus the integral of B, right? That, that sort of thing. Okay, so um, I'm gonna multiply out these two um, binomials here. And so what you get is angle bracket around the first factor, which is now F of T times F of T plus tau and angle bracket minus another angle bracket, which is average F times F of T plus tau minus another angle bracket of F of T times average F plus, the, and the last one is angle bracket around F bar squared, but F bar is just a constant. So there's no reason to angle bracket that. And so that's just F bar squared again, right? I mean, yeah, right. And then you divide by F bar squared. But again, the integral is a linear operator. So any constant inside the integral can come outside the integral. So that means I can take this average F and I can pull it out. And what I'm left with inside these two angle brackets are the angle bracket around F, which again is just average F. And so what you're getting in the end here, this is equal to then uh, the first term here, I'm gonna recopy that down, F of T times F of T plus tau, all angle bracketed, divided by the denominator, average F squared. And then these two terms are each average F squared. So you have a minus two average F squared plus an average F squared, and that gives you a minus average F squared. Divided by the denominator, you just get one. So you have a minus one there. Okay, so this, uh, you know, there are two different ways of writing this. Now, the reason why I went through this exercise here is to show you, in case you guys have had a statistics class, right, or, or have, have, have taken any like module on statistics anytime throughout your, your curriculum, the, the average is the same thing as what's called the expected value, right? So like average Y is the expected value of Y. And usually you do that by summing everything up and dividing by the number of, uh, terms, or you could average over by an integral over a certain, you know, interval. Uh, and that will also give you an average depending on whether you have a continuous variable or a discrete variable, right? So that's the expected value of y, that's the average. Um, but also the variance of y is by definition equal to the expected value of y minus y bar quantity squared. And that's the definition of variance. But a lot of times when people do the variance, they don't calculate this. They expand out this square of a binomial. They expand it out and that ends up being equal to the expected value of, oops, y squared minus average y squared. And it just turns out to be that way. So the, the way that that works out ended up being the exact same thing that we did here, except for instead of having the expected value of y minus y bar quantity squared, this first term, one of those is f at time t and the other one is f of time t plus tau. That's the only difference. So this numerator here, with the angle brackets included, looks a whole lot like a variance, except for one of the two factors, one of the two binomials has a plus tau in it. This is like the expected value of y minus y bar times y at a different time point minus y bar. So it just looks like a variance, it's just one of them is, is time shifted. And there's a reason why that's important. Because, because um, if I go back up to uh, this part of the equation right here, if I go back up to that, I don't think I'm going to have enough room. Um, then at tau equals zero, the g of zero is equal to looking back up here. Now tau is equal to zero, right? So this goes to zero, and these two 
binomial terms are the same. So this ends up being angle bracket, f of t minus f bar, quantity squared, angle bracket, over f bar squared. So the, nor the numerator now is the variance at time t equals zero. So this is the variance. So this is the variance of f divided by the average of f, which is the expected value of f squared. So, so it's, it, this, the, the amplitude of the, of the autocorrelation function has a very special uh, meaning. It has, because you're, you're looking at the fluctuations at the same point in time and you're correlating them with each other, that's the variance, right? So the variance normalized by the average squared, okay? But we can do a little bit more with this, okay? So F equals fluorescence. That's why it's, that's why it's an F, at least in, in, in this formulation of the model. F is the fluorescence, and fluorescence is supposed to be proportional to the number of molecules in, in the volume V, your confocal volume, I should say, in confocal volume V. Okay, so if, if, if F is the fluorescence proportional to the number of molecules, I'm gonna call that N, capital N, right? The number of molecules N. Um, then the proportions and the numerator here has F squared and the denominator has F squared. And so this proportionality constant cancels out, right? So that means that G at time zero is equal to not just the variance of the fluorescence, but the variance in the number of molecules divided by the expected value of the number of molecules squared, or the average number of molecules squared. Okay, now, as we've said in here before, for a Poisson process, and the idea is this is a Poisson process, it's like random arrival of molecules into a particular confocal volume, then the variance is equal to the expected value. For a Poisson process, those two things are the same. Numerically, they're the same. They don't mean the same thing, but they, numerically, they're the same thing. And so this is equal to, the expected value of n divided by the expected value of n quantity squared, which is equal to one over the expected value of n. And of course, the expected value of n is the average number of molecules, one over the average number of molecules in V over your time period. And so that's why, because this is a Poisson process, and because the autocorrelation function is the variance normalized by the mean squared, then the amplitude of your autocorrelation function at a time shift of zero is one over the number of molecules in your volume, the average number of molecules, right? And of course the confocal volume is fairly well-defined. And so then this becomes equal to one over C bar times V, where C bar is the average concentration. So you can get the absolute concentration from your autocorrelation function with a time shift of zero. Now this is very important for a couple reasons. One uh, is that when we were doing, when we were talking about fixed imaging, I mentioned, and I, I didn't go into this too much, but I did mention offhand a couple times that it's really hard to get absolute concentrations from fixed tissues. You're taking your tissues, you're throwing them into formaldehyde, which does all sorts of weird chemical transformations to your tissue, to the biomolecules inside your tissue. Then you're treating them with an antibody and you're treating them with a dye, and then you're imaging with who knows what kinds of variable imaging parameters from day to day. Because you know, the microscope might have different you know, settings. You're, you're, and there's all sorts of transformations that are happening going from the, the, the fluorescence that's actually coming off your sample to what the de computer is detecting or recording. Um, so you have a lot of different variables that are in there that are hard to control for, especially in fixed tissues. So when you, when you measure fixed tissues, that's why a lot of times we were talking about the dorsal width, the dorsal gradient width, and not the amplitude. 
because it's hard to get absolute concentrations from, from fixed, fixed tissue imaging. In live tissues, it's a little bit easier because um, every single GFP molecule should have a very particular uh, fluorescence intensity. Um, that will change from microscope settings, but if you're very careful about those, then you can kind of get a good feel for, uh, for um, relative concentrations. So uh, if I'm looking at one embryo one day and it's a certain brightness, and I'm looking at a different embryo another day and it's twice as bright, probably means there's twice as much GFP the second time. But that still doesn't give you absolute concentrations because there's a proportionality constant in there. This will give you absolute concentrations and it does not depend on your microscope parameters. Uh, it doesn't depend on your laser power. Uh, it doesn't depend on you know, what treatment you did to the embryo. It's just statistics of how the molecule is fluctuating around inside your tissue. Um, and the only thing that could throw that off is if you're, um, something's going on that makes it not Poisson inside your, in your, inside your tissue. But in general, things are, that are fluctuating around by thermal diffusivity, uh, they're expected to be Poisson. Now I said it doesn't depend on your microscope parameters, but if you choose the wrong parameters for your microscope, then, then you're gonna get garbage anyway, right? So everything depends on microscope parameters at some level. Okay, all right. So uh, I just wanted to go through that to show you why this autocorrelation function, the amplitude is related to the, the concentration. So that's fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. But what we're doing, what we're gonna be talking about is raster image correlation spectroscopy. And that's taking advantage of the fact that the confocal microscope is imaging things pixel by pixel. And there's a certain pix pixel dwell time where you, you image one pixel, and then a certain time period later, you image the next pixel. And you do that over and over again to build up a whole line. At the end of that line, the laser has to slow down, stop, go back in the other direction, retrace its steps, but go down to the next line, slow down, stop, turn around, and speed back up to the right speed. And then you start imaging your image again, and then you have certain pixel dwell times again, and you build up the second line, and then the third line, et cetera, right? And so what you, what you have in a confocal microscope is you have two different time scales, um, or two different speeds. You have a fast scanning direction and a slow scanning direction. So if I look at two different pixels here, um, and it's gonna be hard because these are red arrows and my, my, my pen here in PowerPoint is red. But if I look at two pixels there and two pixels there, there are completely different time scales between those two pixels. These two pixels, the difference in time of imaging them is on the order of a microsecond. But these two pixels, their difference in time is on the order of a millisecond. This is just very different. Um, and that is actually useful because we can build up a, an autocorrelation function, and this will be a two-dimensional autocorrelation function. Instead of having just a time shift tau, now we have two different time shifts that we can look at. We have a fast tau and a slow tau because we have a fast scanning direction and a slow scanning direction, okay? So let's think about building the autocorrelation function, but let's think about a case in which we have very slow diffusion, right? So, um, you know, this molecule is essentially immobile, right? So let's just say we're imaging molecules that aren't moving. Okay, <clears throat> so if, if I, um, and the other thing about raster image correlation spectroscopy is you have to be zoomed in really far below what's known as the area unit. Have we mentioned the area unit in here? No? Okay, so in, conf so in any microscopy, because you're going through lenses, it actually, you have this, this diffraction limit, right? So a single point molecule, which is, you know, has a, a diameter on the order of like, a, a, you know, maybe a few angstroms, that will look like in the image, it will show up as a bright spot that is uh, maybe uh, a few hundred nanometer in, in, in size, right? So you're actually, uh, the, the, a single point will spread out because of the diffraction limit of your microscope to be a few hundred nanometers in diameter, okay? And so you actually can't get better resolution than that. And that's, that's a physical limit on your microscope. You can get around that through weird processes, but just like general like fluorescence measurements, uh, you can only get down to a certain uh, width. And typically you don't wanna go below that width uh, for your pixel diameter, but in raster image correlation spectroscopy, you do. And so um, we were usually about one fifth below the area unit. So a single molecule will show up in like a five by five pixel grid. And, you know, well, that's not that great you, you would think, but um, it's actually very useful. So if you have a, um, 
a very slow moving molecule and an immobile molecule. And I image that molecule in pixel one, because the molecule shows up in a five by five pixel grid, I'll see it in pixel two and three and four and five. But then the, the image intensity will start to drop off. And so the correlation of something above average will look like what's known as the point spread function, will look like this airy limit. And so in the fast scanning direction, if I see a molecule here, I will continue to see it for several pixels until I don't see it anymore. Right. And so these these pixels here that are all close to zero, all close to the center of the point spread function, uh, they'll be highly correlated with each other. Because if you see a molecule in pixel one, you'll see it in pixel two, three, four, five, et cetera. Um, similarly, because it's immobile, by the time I get back down to the next line, I'll see it again. And by the time I get down to the next line again, I'll see it again and again and again. And eventually uh, I won't see it anymore. Because I'll get si outside of the point spread function. OK, so in this case of slow diffusion, this autocorrelation function will look like the point spread function in the fast scanning direction and in the slow scanning direction. That's a heat map, a two dimensional heat map. A three dimensional view will look like this. And if I drew like a, a contour around this, the contour would look like a circle. If I take a fast cut of this three dimensional autocorrelation function and a slow cut, a cut in the fast direction and a slow direction, and I plot them on top of each other, they look almost the same. Because as far as the, the molecule is concerned, it's not moving and everything is being uh, the fast scanning direction, the slow scanning direction, it doesn't matter which one you're going in. In the case two, if you have a fast diffuser, so in, in general, molecules inside tissues, even the fastest ones diffusing the fastest are slow compared to the fast scanning direction. So I will still image the same molecule multiple times in the fast scanning direction like in a five by five pixel grid. But by the time I get down to the next line, the molecule might be gone. Okay, so in a fast direction, the autocorrelation function still looks as wide as the point spread function. If I can draw like a horizontal or a vertical line here, it's the same width in the fast direction. But in the slow direction, the autocorrelation function, you lose correlations much more quickly in that direction. And so the autocorrelation function in 3D looks more like a, a wafer almost, and cuts of the fast and slow scanning direction don't look the same anymore. Okay, so by, by doing, um, by using this raster image, imaging data, building an autocorrelation function from it, and looking at the fast and slow scanning directions, I can tell something about how fast my molecule is moving. Actually, it's only looking at the slow scanning direction, because the fast scanning direction always looks like the point spread function. That's, it's actually a good internal control. You can see whether or not, hey, I'm seeing the point spread function. Uh, just like I should. Now let's look at the slow scanning direction to see if I have a fast, sorry, a slow molecule or a fast molecule. Okay. All right, so that's what we did. So we, we did imaging like this. Um, we're, we're way zoomed in and we're imaging this really rapidly. And we can take this, this imaging data that we see here, this is a dorsal GFP, and we can build from it an autocorrelation function. This is an actual autocorrelation function from data, uh, unlike the ones in the previous slide, which were just like computationally made up, right? <clears throat> okay, so this is what the actual autocorrelation function looks like from data, and I can look at the fast and slow cuts of this, and I, I didn't, that wasn't the sentence I should have started <laughs> at that point. Okay, so I, <laughs> I can take um, the autocorrelation function, I can fit it to this model, All right? So this model looks, looks freaky, um, but uh, it's actually pretty simple, okay? And I'll get, it, get into the model in a second, but suffice it to say that, that you have the diffusivity as an adjustable parameter. And that's pretty much it, right? Everything else in here just about is microscope parameters. Okay, so what is the, what is the slow cut look like? Because I don't care about the fast cut, I only care about the slow cut. So the slow cut looks like this, and I can fit this, uh, our, our model here, our equation, to these data here, and I get this green curve. Okay, something's freaking out about the, I don't know why it's freaking out, okay. Um, I can get this green curve here, and this is a very slow diffusivity. By comparison, here's a fast diffusivity in the gray curve. Okay, so let's, let's unpack this model just a little bit. Uh, first of all, let me say something about where the model comes from. It comes from a differential equation where we've assumed that everything is freely diffusing. I didn't leave myself quite enough room here. Um, so it assumes that I have a free diffuser, so I can write down this differential equation of a free diffuser. And from this differential equation, I can like apply some sort of like integral techniques and solve it in a certain way. And I get this autocorrelation function from it, okay? 
Now let's look at, at, at what this autocorrelation function means. So here, this tau p, this is the pixel dwell time in the fast scanning direction. And that has a, uh, that, that's about one microsecond. And this tau L, which also shows up in multiple places, uh, this is the line time, the line scan time. And that is about one millisecond, 10 to the minus three seconds. This delta X here and this delta Y, they're the same. They're how big our pixel is. So this is the pixel size. And I want to be about five times below the area unit. unit so there are, they are about 0 0.05 uh, micrometers, microns. This W0, this is the XY radius of this point spread function of this area unit, uh, and also of, of the volume, my confocal volume, same thing. And that's about, or they're roughly the same thing. That was about 0.3 microns. And so you can see that the pixel size is, it's one sixth in this case, right? Uh, about one sixth of the size of my area unit. And this is the Z radius here. And that is, it's a different, it's ellipsoidal, right? So it's longer, it's more spread out in Z. So that's about one micron. So most of these things we know from just the microscope parameters. And, and C and eta are the coordinates of the autocorrelation function in the fast and slow scanning direction, respectively. Um, A is some adjustable parameter, B is some adjustable parameter, just, to, just for robustness of the fit. Okay, and then you have D, which is your diffusivity. So all of these things are, are pretty well known, except for D. D is your main adjustable parameter, and you can adjust D until you get a fit to the autocorrelation function, right? And the reason why um, I mentioned that even for a fast diffuser, the, um, the fast scanning direction is, is too fast for it. And that's because the time, let me scroll down a little bit so I have more room. The time for diffusion across one pixel um, is tau d diffusion time, which is approximately equal to W0 squared over 4D. So this is not across one pixel. This is across uh, the area unit. Um, and that's approximately equal to 10 to the minus 3 seconds if you plug in the right numbers. And that's approximately equal to the same thing as your line time. So because your line time is three orders of magnitude greater than your pixel dwell time, then as far as, as molecules moving around are concerned, they're essentially immobile, right? Because, you know, the scan is three, uh, three orders of magnitude faster than its ability to diffuse. Okay, so that's, um, that's just the breakdown of the model. I'm showing you A, that all these parameters, most of them are microscope parameters, and B, that the, the fast scanning direction is just way too fast for diffusing molecules, at least in biological tissues. Okay, so we can take our, our data, we can fit our model to the data, and we get a, a decent fit, but there are some things wrong with it. For example, systematically, uh, it differs right here. Systematically, it's slightly differing right here, and then, uh, you know, it goes up, it's basically below the curve there, above the curve there, below the curve there. So it's not uh, that good of a fit. And in fact, if you are a modeler, and looking at this, you say, well, maybe I don't even have the right model. Maybe this, this equation isn't the right thing to describe this. Okay, but we're gonna march on for a little bit. Okay, and so we, we've, measured, we've measured the diffusivity of dorsal GFP in different parts of the embryo, right? So on the ventral side of the embryo, we get a diffusivity ranging from like super small to kind of like middling uh, above one, kind of around one. Um, but if I look in the lateral parts of the embryo, I have a higher diffusivity. And the dorsal parts of the embryo may be a still higher, although you know, these two things aren't necessarily statistically significant from each other. Okay, so what that means is on the ventral side, I have slow diffusivity. Lateral side, uh, 
and dorsal side, I have fast diffusivity comparatively, right? And the, the way that I differentiate ventral from lateral from dorsal side is the nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. So if it's high in the nucleus and low in the cytoplasm, I say that's the ventral side. If it's high in the cyto cytoplasm, low in the nucleus, that is uh, the dorsal side. Okay, so I can measure the diffusivity in multiple places in the embryo, and I can see there's a gradient. So not only is there a gradient in concentration, there's a gradient in how fast dorsal can move. And this, is, this, this um, trend is because of dorsal GFP in the nucleus, not in the cytoplasm. So if I look at, and this is what I just showed you here, but if I look at just the nuclei and measure the diffusivity in just the nuclei and ignore the cytoplasm, I have the same trend. It's actually exacerbated a little bit. And if I look in just the cytoplasm, I don't have a trend. And these things here are p-values, right? So p-values for whether this slope is, is different from zero. And uh, so it, it doesn't meet the, 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 the level to reject the null hypothesis, which says that there is no slope, there's no trend, okay? So it's basically dorsal GFP in the nucleus is slower on the ventral side than it is on the dorsal side. But in the cytoplasm, it doesn't matter where you are, it's diffusing the same, okay? All right, so because it was something that was in the nucleus, we also wanted to look at a different method to measure a different set of parameters. And this method is called fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching. So whenever you, um, whenever you image a GFP molecule, you have a certain chance of also destroying it and, and by oxidizing it. So it doesn't become, so it's not fluorescent anymore. And that is called bleaching because you're oxidizing the, the molecule. Um, and it's called photo bleaching because you're uh, oxidizing it by uh, a photon. <laughs> so, um, but what you can do is you can on purpose photo bleach your GFP molecules. So what you're looking at here is a movie where we are on purpose photo bleaching all the GFP molecules in this nucleus. But over time, they come back. The fluorescence comes back. But oxidation is this irreversible process. So the same GFP molecules won't suddenly become fluorescent again. So what we're looking at here, this recovery of the fluorescence after photo bleaching, uh, is because there's dorsal GFP molecules in the cytoplasm that eventually go into the nucleus, right? So there's exchange between the nucleus and the cytoplasm, a dynamic exchange. And so um, all the dorsal GFP molecules that get bleached here, they eventually leave the, the nucleus and the ones in the cytoplasm uh, replace them. And eventually you get recovery of this fluorescence, which you can see here, the recovery. And this yellow curve is a fit to the data of a simplified differential equation of the system. And then we can measure what is our in nuclear import rate and our nuclear export rate. So using this method, we can measure diffusivity, uh, sorry, with the previous method, we can measure diffusivity. With this method, we can measure import and export rates from the nucleus. And when we did this and looked in different parts of the embryo, it turns out that the nuclear export rate differed depending on where we're looking at the embryo. So what, what this bar graph says is on the ventral side of the embryo, nuclear import rate is as such. On the dorsal side of the embryo, nuclear em import rate is as such. And those, these two things are not statistically significant from one another. But if I'm looking at nuclear export, then the ventral side of the embryo, the nuclear export is definitely slower than on the dorsal side of the embryo. Okay, so where does this leave us? So when we're looking at different parts of the embryo and we're talking about the mobility of, the dorsal, of dorsal, either how fast it can diffuse or how fast it can get outside the nucleus, there's a gradient. There's a gradient. So you have lower diffusivity and lower nuclear export on the ventral side of the embryo higher diffusivity and higher nuclear export on the dorsal side of the embryo, which is illustrated kind of in this little bar graph here. So what is causing this to happen? Why is dorsal slower on the ventral side? Only in the nucleus, it has to do with the nucleus. And the reason why is because on the ventral side of the embryo, dorsal in the nucleus is bound to the DNA. So I have diffu diffusion in the nucleus and also dorsal can bind to the DNA, okay? And what we can do to figure that out, whether that's true, to measure how much dorsal is bound to the DNA is something called a cross-correlation. So everything up until this point, we've been talking about autocorrelation, where dorsal GFP fluctuations have been correlated to dorsal GFP fluctuations. But here we can do a cross-correlation where dorsal GFP fluctuations are correlated to the H2A RFP fluctuations. H2A RFP, histone red fluorescence protein. So now I can correlate the fluctuations in dorsal with fluctuations, movements of the DNA inside the, uh, inside the nucleus. And there's, there's correlation, the, the cross correlation function has a very clear peak if you're looking at the ventral side, but on the dorsal side, there's no peak. So there's a very high correlation between fluctuations of dorsal and DNA together in nuclei on the ventral side. And there's no correlation 
between dorsal and um, DNA fluctuations on the dorsal side, which means that dorsal is bound to DNA on the ventral side. It's not bound to DNA on the dorsal side. Okay. And uh, what we can do with this is we can actually calculate a nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. Sorry, we can calculate, uh, sorry, the ratio of dorsal that is free uh, to diffuse, not bound to DNA, um, from looking at these cross correlation functions. And on the dorsal side of the embryo, as you can see from a low nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, on the dorsal side of the embryo, almost all of it's free, none of it's bound to DNA. And then as you get to higher and higher nuclear cytoplasmic uh, uh, ratios, um, more and more dorsals bound to DNA. So according to, uh, let's see if I can just do this really quick. I have the notes for it queued up here, so I might as well write it down. So according to this cross correlation function, one minus phi, let me just define my terms here. Phi is fraction of dorsal free, which means one minus phi is fraction of dorsal bound to DNA. I, I guess I should say free to diffuse, right? So phi is a fraction of dorsal that's free to diffuse. One minus phi is therefore the fraction that's bound to DNA, okay? And that is equal to our measurement is equal to the amplitude of the cross correlation function divided by the amplitude of the autocorrelation function, but in the red channel, so of the histone. And if I take the ratio of these two, then I get the amount of dorsal that's bound to the DNA. Now, I don't want to do that kind of derivation. I mean, we could, but uh, I don't think we have enough time to, to do that in this class. So, um, but just suffice it to say, that we can use the cross-correlation method to measure um, how, what, what fraction of it is correlated to each other, right? What fraction of dorsals bound to, the, to, to DNA, okay? And so that's where we get this, this plot from, right? So we can measure how much of dorsals bound to the DNA, um, and it's, uh, well, phi is how much dorsal is free. So it's that, that's high on the dorsal side, and as you get more and more towards the ventral side, it becomes lower. Now, that was just one way of measuring phi. Okay, so we know that dorsal is bound to the DNA in the nuclei sometimes, which means that our previous autocorrelation function model that we were using to fit to the data was wrong because that previous autocorrelation function came from the assumption that we just had diffusion, <clears throat> right? But now we know that there's diffusion and there's binding. So I have two pools of dorsal in my system. I have a freely diffusing dorsal, which has a diffusivity of whatever, like three microns squared per second. And I have a bound one, which has a diffusivity of essentially zero. My previous data that I was showing you, this is the one component model, the best fit, you know, there were problems with it, right? Like I was saying, if I switch to this two component model where I have dorsal that could diffuse and some dorsal that is bound, then what I get is an almost perfect fit to my data, which suggests that the data, sorry, it, which means that the data, the data are suggesting that I really do have two components here in my system, right? And the way that this two component model is constructed is you have, um, you have uh, an autocorrelation function that would appear if you had no diffusion. That's just the point spread function, right? This is the point spread function because no diffusion is happening. And you have an autocorrelation function where you have diffusion happening. And that's the one that I kept showing you before we have five microns squared per second. And the linear combination of those two gives us the fit. So if I have the right diffusivity and the right linear combination weight, then I will get a nice fit to my data. Okay, so now I have two adjustable parameters, diffusion for the diffusive one, and then the linear combination weights. And it turns out that the linear combination weight is this phi. This is the fraction of dorsal free. So I have two different ways to measure phi. I can measure it by the cross correlation function, and I can measure it by how well the two component model fits my data. Okay, and so if I plot those on top of each other, where you have uh, phi plotted and uh, calculated in two different ways, one by cross correlation and one by the two component model, they largely agree. 
it's not perfect, right? I mean, if you plot them together, there's this high correlation between the two, but it's not, it's not perfect, right? Because both of them are, are noisy ways of measuring something, okay? So, but suffice it to say that this is a, a really good way to be able to measure the fraction of my dorsal GFP molecule that's actually immobile. So just to, to summarize, what we can do with RICS, so we, we talked about FRAP a little bit. Let's leave that aside for now because there wasn't much to that, but most of this lecture was about RICS. What can we do with RICS? We can measure the dorsal diffusivity. We can measure its absolute concentration, and we can measure how well, the fraction of it that's actually bound to the DNA. All right, so just to, just to finish up, to kind of land this, this RICS uh, discussion, remember that dorsal is bound to the DNA on the ventral side. But on the dorsal side, it's in the nucleus. We can measure it. We see it in the nucleus. We get an autocorrelation function for it, so we know it's there. It's doing something, but it's not binding DNA. The thing is, dorsal is a transcription factor. So why is it binding the DNA on the ventral side, but not at all on the dorsal side? And the reason why is on the ventral side, you have free dorsal binding to DNA. But on the dorsal side, most of the dorsal is dorsal cactus complex. So we can measure dorsal in the nucleus on the dorsal side that can't bind DNA. It's probably dorsal cactus complex, right? So <laughs> it gives, gets us back to the thing that we've been talking about here for a while, which is we had a model that suggested that dorsal cactus complex has to be in the nucleus. And it had all sorts of implications that all came true. It had some predictions uh, about dosage, uh, robustness that came true, et cetera. But also this is the only way to explain our data. That's actually not true, it's not the only way. There's another way to explain the data, which is um, uh, toll signaling is happening on the ventral side of the embryo. That's why cactus gets destroyed. That's why dorsal can go into the nucleus at a higher rate than, than normal. Um, toll signaling happens by phosphorylating cactus. Toll signaling also phosphorylates dorsal, which is something we've never talked about in here before. So it's possible that phosphodorsal, which is only present on the ventral side, uh, binds to DNA better than dorsal that's not phosphorylated. So there's two different competing hypotheses, one of which matches up with my own pet uh, theory that I've been holding on to for the past seven years, um, and one which is known to, to happen, uh, but is not known to influence DNA binding. Right, so we don't know which one it is, but it would be nice to be able to do these uh, experiments to figure out the difference between these two hypotheses. And actually maybe both are happening, okay? Uh, and so this kind of gets back to the idea that maybe dorsal cactus complex is in the nucleus.